Welcome to our first episode of Digging In. I really do hope that you find these videos to be informative as we look at different issues that are sent in to us, different questions rather, that are sent in to us through Facebook, Twitter, um, or emails that have to do with biblical creation and how different issues in science can actually be applied using scripture or using the young earth creation model. Now, of course, I'm going to use reference materials from other authors, and I'll put those in the links and descriptions below as I have uh, referenced different people here um, who have either cited different uh, scientists who've conducted studies, or it could possibly be just someone's direct words. So I'm going to read the first question uh, that we were uh, had submitted earlier, or the end of last week. And it's from our friend Josh, who says, Did the continent separate when God came down to scatter the people across the face of the earth? Keep these about 10 minutes so that we can hopefully keep your attention span for that long. And if I, if I don't answer your question, or if you want me to go deeper, uh, further in detail, I will release separate videos additionally once those videos have been released. So the um, first topic we're going to look at is continental drift, which, of course, a lot of people, when they think of continental drift, they may think of the movie Ice Age, um, the animated movie released many, many years ago. Um, but we're going to be talking about plate tectonics. Okay? Now, a gentleman named Alfred Wegener is actually the one who's given credit by most scientists back in the 1960s. And he theorized that there was horizontal movement that was taking place underneath the Earth or underneath all um, continents and oceans, so the entire Earth that was causing different things to occur, like mountain ranges and earthquakes and volcanoes. Um, this idea was actually first proposed in recorded history by a gentleman named Antonio Snyder, who was a creationist. And back in 1859, around when Charles Darwin's book Origin of Species was released, he actually was one of the first ones who came up with this idea that it was actually recorded. Uh, Genesis 1, 9 through 10 talks about the gathering of seas in one place during the creation week. So most scientists agree that the earth was all connected, all the land masses were one, and a lot of people have referred to this as Pangaea. Now, the interpretation of how did it all come together, how did it split apart, how long did it take, there's a lot of debate there. Most naturalists, most secular scientists, or people who endorse the Big Bang Theory and you know the idea that the earth is billions of years old, they will all pretty much just about agree that um, Pangaea took millions and millions of years to separate. Someone like myself, who's a young earth creationist, believes in catastrophic plate tectonics, which is the idea that things happened very rapidly as a result of Noah's flood. So if you go back to Genesis 6 through 8, those chapters, the Bible talks about Noah's flood, talks about the great flood. Now, most scientists are going to agree that all the continents were once connected, They'll also agree that there's many different fossil types that are found across the ocean basins. They'll also agree that there's zebra stripe patterns that indicate magnetic reversals, which of course is evidence that you know the mid-ocean rifts, the parallel motion along those, um, that something has caused that to change over time. And then of course seismic observations from earthquakes and you know things that are occurring underneath the ocean surface. So there's a lot of different evidence that plate tectonics is a plausible theory. Now, as a result of plate tectonics, there's three main things. You have seafloor spreading, which of course is new seafloor being created at uh, places like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, middle of the Atlantic Ocean. You also have transform faulting, which would be like stripes, uh, strike slip faults uh, near the San Andreas Fault out in California. And then of course you have subduction zones and mountains, which are when compressional deformation takes place. So when you have plates that are pushing against each other, sometimes the um, ocean crust and continental crust will subduct, they'll submerge, and then one will go under the other. Um, you'll also have where they uh, compress together, and then they go up and they form mountains, like what we see all across the, you know, across the world. Now, I'd like to talk to you about some of the problems with the uniformitarian view. And that big word is um, essentially that things gradually change at the same rate over time. So people who endorse a really old earth uh, believe in this idea called uniformitarianism, which was first proposed by a gentleman named Charles Lyell, uh, who I believe was a uh, English lawyer maybe back in the late 1800s. And um, the zebra stripe pattern that a lot of scientists agree 
is responsible for magnetic reversals along the ocean, uh, mid-ocean ridges, um, does not actually occur when you take rock samples. It's just something that's um, observed in that stri zebra stripe pattern. But when you take actual rock samples, it's not something that fluctuates to demonstrate and show this great magnetic reversal. Um, because of the rapid formation of basalt, which is a volcanic rock typically underneath the ocean, this combined with rapid field reversals, that would be something evidenced of some catastrophe. And as I mentioned before, uh, catastrophic plate tectonics is an idea that Dr. John Baumgartner uh, proposed from the Los Alamos National Laboratory. He actually used one of the biggest supercomputers ever to create this model to demonstrate and show that things would have had to happen very rapidly, very spontaneously. Um, it's you know, pretty well known that his supercomputer models were some of the best representations of plate tectonics using more modern technology. So Dr. John uh, Baumgartner, someone who of course is a creationist, someone who endorses this idea that things would have happened very rapidly, is a very credible scientist to show that continental drift probably occurred in a very short amount of time. Now prior to this, Dr. Russell Humphreys, who's a physicist, he actually theorized that the rapid field reversals would be in lava flows that would be thin enough to cool in just a few weeks. There was a, um, I'm kind of referencing some notes here because these two gentlemen, their uh, names I was not familiar with when I looked this up, Co and Prevot, or Prevo, however you say that, uh, later confirmed this and their research showed magnetic reversals were astonishingly rapid. So these are actual physicists, these are people out in the field doing this kind of research that are all coming up with this same conclusion that the zebra stripe pattern of the, that indicates magnetic reversals in the ocean seafloor is actually something that would have had to happen very rapidly because of the fact that you cannot observe this when you take rock samples. It's something that's theorized through the different layers but is not something that's widely accepted as constantly happening over a really long time. The reason those reversals exist is because of very rapid formations that occurred as a result of some catastrophe. Now Genesis 7:11 and 8:2 both talk about the fountains of the deep breaking open and the floodgates of heaven opening up and, and just raining down on the earth. Um, these are both, you know, parts of passages in God's word, if we're to take it literally, that could have, you know, very good explanation in terms of what kind of event must have been taken place uh, for the earth to experience such a catastrophe and such big changes. You know, the Bible says that it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, during this time, there would have had to been some rapid subduction of the pre-flood uh, pre ocean floor that would have happened into the mantle, which would have created new ocean floor that would have been drastically hotter especially in the upper 100 kilometers or so of the, uh, the mantle, not just at the ridges, but absolutely everywhere. Now, the new ocean floor would be a lot less dense because it would be so much hotter. We know that of things that are hot, they tend to be less dense. And this would actually imply a very dramatic rise in sea level. So all of this happening, you know, when heat rises, all of this occurring at the same time would have pushed everything upward. The Grand Canyon could have been made in just a much shorter amount of time than what is indicated by a um, secular scientist who would say that it was, you know, rapid deposition and weathering from the Colorado River that was cutting into the canyon, even though the elevations are, you know, uh, would not be able to work. The Colorado River is actually uh, lower than the entry point of the Grand Canyon. Um, but if you just take a jar of dirt, fill it up with water, and shake it up, over you know, a few minutes, you're going to have rapid deposition of these different layers. Things that are larger are going to settle down at the bottom, and then they're just going to move upward as you have your smaller, finer grain materials that are going to settle near the top. Now Psalm 104, 6 and 7 says that the mountains rose up and the valleys sank down. Um, this would coincide with Genesis 8, 4 as you look at the mountains of Ararat, which was the resting place of the ark after the 150th day of the flood. So the flood was not just a 40-day event. Noah and his family stayed there about a year. Um, and as this flood event allowed them to kind of get, you know, rested upon those mountains, um, you know, we, we realized that the surface would have had to look very much drastically different 
after the flood ended, after they got off the ark. So both creationist and secularist are left with the same problem, okay? Whether you believe in creation, young earth, old earth, or whether you completely endorse, you know, what's taught in the public school classroom, that uniformitarianism is something that we observe, that everything has happened the same as it does today over a long period of time, the present is the key to the past, um, these are the kind of things that are really a burden for people who have their own opinion. Because regardless of what your belief is, you're left with this notion that we've got to go back in time and put these things together. I tend to stay on the side of Scripture is 100% right, that until it is proven to be incorrect, that I'm going to go with that as my guide, and science has to line up with Scripture. See, if you're coming at this, you know, with these questions, if you're looking at something through a lens that Scripture is not infallible, that Scripture could be right or couldn't be right, how are you sure about your own salvation if you know Jesus is your personal Savior? How can you trust what God says about salvation if you don't take everything that he discusses in his word regarding creation, regarding um, the commandments, and you know the different events that took place in Jesus' life, part of his ministry? How can you trust any of that if you don't trust his creative acts? Okay, So when we look at that, we see the things occurring today that occur. That does not mean that there were not great catastrophes that took place in the past. Even someone who would call themselves a secular scientist or a naturalist, or you know, sometimes we in the creationist circle refer to them as evolutionist, um, and I don't think that's always fair, but they even believe in a certain amount of catastrophe, whether or not they will agree to it, and it's ice ages, you know, flooding, different things that occur. Those are considered catastrophes as well, catastrophic events, massive volcanic eruptions, asteroids hitting the Earth's surface and causing the dinosaurs to, you know, supposedly go extinct, which we can talk about in another program as well. So no matter what your question is, you're going to have to ask yourself, if I look back at Scripture, am I going to trust what God's Word says and let the science be dictated based on that? Or does the Bible have to try to meet the expectations of what I've created in my mind as science, the evidence that shows me what actually took place? In other words, are you going to trust the Bible and then science? Or are you going to trust science and then the Bible or just parts of it? So I hope this question was interesting to you. I hope that it kind of maybe helped clarify some things, maybe give you some type of... Um, explanation as to why biblical creation can be something that we can trust, that God's Word is something that we can depend on. And of course, there's going to be a lots of other questions that come from this. You know, who wrote different books of the Bible? How do we know that it was not translated based on what the person of the time wanted? How can we rely on Scripture? And those are other topics that we can look at another time. But if you've not already done so, I hope that you've liked this video. I hope that you subscribe to our channel. I do hope that you'll go back and watch other videos. And please feel free to share our channel with people that you think may be interested in these topics. Um, I look forward to your comments. Um, you can always uh, touch base with us on Facebook, uh, on Twitter. You can send us an email at creationandcompost at gmail.com. And we will absolutely look forward to hearing from you and interacting. God bless. Always be prepared to teach the truth, and uh, we'll talk to you soon.